This is Duke University. Hi, everybody. Welcome to um, Practicing Private International Law, hosted by the International Law Society. My name is Erica, and I'm the president. And today we have two great alumni with us. We have Lynn Shua, who graduated 20, in uh, year 2000 and is currently the managing director at GE. And we also have Christian Broadbent, who is a GD LLM from 99 and is currently at the SEC. And right now they're going to tell you a little bit about their career paths, how they got there, the kind of things they've been working on, and the different international aspects of their practices. So I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> so hello, everyone. Enjoy your lunch. Please feel free to eat while we're sitting here, because I wish I was in your position. <laughs> um, I'm going to just start with the formalities. Uh, anything that I speak here reflects my own personal opinion. It doesn't reflect any of that of GE. So those are the formalities. <laughs> So um, Erica asked that we talk a little bit about our careers, how we got to where we are. So I'm just going to go down that path very high level factually on what happened. And then feel free to jump in whenever you think it. you have a question. You don't have to wait to the very end. So um, I grew up in Singapore myself and went to undergrad and law school in Australia. And after practicing there for a short number of years, I moved to Durham, Duke, and did my LLM back in 2000. And after the LLM, I joined Simpson Thatcher in New York, where I did the full rotation through the corporate department, M&A, capital markets, banking, the whole lot. And then after that, uh, take a, took a slight detour. For personal reasons, my husband's Dutch. Um, we moved to the Netherlands, where I joined De Braille Blackstone Westbrook, a Dutch law firm, and practiced very much European um, corporate and banking international work and did that uh, out of Netherlands for a number of years. And we relocated back uh, in 2006 to New York City. And at that point in time, that was a juncture where I had to decide between staying in the law firm, and I was considering going back to Simpson, or going towards the other sector, which is going in-house. And then it made sense for us, and I had a nice offer. It came from GE, and I joined GE Capital based in Stanford. Connecticut. And that's six years later, I'm still with G Capital. I'm in a very global business that handles transactions uh, all over the world. I am based out of the U.S., but we have people stationed globally. And, uh, and that, that's where I am today. Handing over to you, Christian. That's much more exciting than mine. So, <laughs> although I do, I have a longer disclaimer than you. So. Um, anything I do is not representative of uh, the, uh, the commission, any of the commissioners or the employees of the agency. Uh, now that that's out of the way, um, I was born in Nebraska, so it's a really interesting uh, Midwestern place. Um, I did uh, spend some time overseas as a young child, as a Navy brat, um, and traveled around a little bit. Um, did my LLM here, uh, JDLM at the law school, was very involved in the International Journal, um, had a lot of fun with, um, with that, worked very hard as well. And um, after law school, I went and started doing a little bit of international law with a large uh, New York-based law firm. And it was an um, international uh, maritime border dispute where nation states were disputing in the Middle East, were disputing borders. And uh, about a year into my practice, they settled. So they said, would you like to do securities law? And I said, sure, because securities law was actually good then. Uh, the market was good, <laughs> unlike, unlike today. Then I went to uh, Wilmer, to, uh, Wilmer Hale, um, merger of uh, Washington and Boston-based law firms. Did mostly securities laws, um, the 33 and 34 Act. Um, and then I um, thought I might want to try public service. I, try, I, I called Jim Cox, um, and uh, he gave me a great, a great suggestion to call Duke alum who was at the agency, and I did that. And he helped me eventually kind of identify where I might fit in and the skill sets I could, I could use and, and new skill, set, skill sets I could, I could gain there. I started doing um, the 40 acts, which are a pair of acts that were, um, that were designed after the, um, the crash, uh, along with the 33 and 34 act, to address problems in the investment company space and the investment advisory space. So I did that for about two and a half years, then I worked for a commissioner at the agency. And there are five commissioners, one of whom is also the chairman. They're all presidential appointees. They each have a small personal staff, and we advise them on all policy-related matters and various and sundry other, other things. Um, 
We have a small portfolio of things. I focused, again, still on the investment companies and investment advisors. I do some international work. I do a lot of enforcement work. I do some um, investigation examination uh, examinations work. I also do uh, ethics work. So take that ethics class seriously. It's actually, I use it almost every day. Um, uh, then I went back to um, I, I went back to the staff after that. I spent about a year working for the division of um, investment management director, doing special projects, looking at credit default swaps, um, and other things. Uh, mind you, this was in uh, you know before the crash. So this was 2007, 2008. I was looking at it early on, and then I was invited to come back to work for commissioner as a senior counsel, and the incoming commissioner, you know, Commissioner Walter, and I've been with her for four years now, and. Um, and I continue to, my practice has expanded quite a bit under her. She's the international representative for the agency. Mm -hmm. She's been the representative for IOSCO, which is the International Securities um, Standard Center, I guess is a good way to describe it. And also the Financial Stability Board, which is run out of the BIS in Switzerland. And the SEC has quite a bit of involvement in, in, those, in those entities. The FSB is a, it's beyond securities law. One would say more focused on banking law. So I do support her and do quite a bit of work in that area. So does anybody have any questions to kind of get us started off? Anything that they've said so far that's really piqued your interest that you want to learn more about? Okay. So what's been your favorite part of your different practices, the international component? What has, been, what has it been that really sucks you in and makes you have fun at your job and still like it and make it interesting every day? You know, what's interesting about international law is it's nothing like I thought it was going to be as a law student. Um, and, and even as a law student, you know, I took all these different classes. I took, you know, like a civil law and international trade law, and it was kind of all over the place. I mean, really, it's, it's a... It's something that's inherent in lots of different areas of law. There's not necessarily an international law. In, in securities law, we look at it through that lens. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that at the agency has m multiple different dimensions in the sense that we, we do, um, we provide technical assistance to other countries who are, uh, you know, wanting to understand the securities laws in the United States, which is considered to be relatively well-developed um, um, on, on, by many standards. We also provide and do a lot of international regulatory work. Again, you know, kind of interfacing with these large standard setting international bodies to, um, to strike a, oh, I would call it a very delicate balance between what the world wants and what the US regulators want on, on many different high profile things. For example, uh, now we're looking at things like derivatives, uh, money market funds um, is another hot one recently. So, so you name it that's been on the um, domestic agenda and all the things that are in Dodd-Frank are also of interest to the foreign regulators, especially European regulators, as they try to deal with the very same things we are. To try and sync those things up um, uh, it can be quite, quite a challenge. And so it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, diplomacy, it's a lot of strategy, uh, some substance and uh, securities law mixed with uh, understanding the different international regimes. That's, that sounds really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> if I could ask a follow-up to that, do you find yeah. yourself interacting with your counterparts in other countries? Do you do a lot of research on your own? How does that, how does that work? So, so I don't. We have, um, the way the agency is, is set up is you have the five commissioners and then you have division directors. We have multiple different divisions, one of, one of which is the International Affairs Office. We have a, a director. The, the commission is a staff run organization in the sense that they're the experts, they make the recommendations to the commissioners, mm -hmm. and our job is to kind of be the, the man in the middle, the woman in the middle, to filter it and say, okay, this is good for your policy, this is not, this is good for the agency, this is not, and kind of try and make sense of it for, for my particular uh, principle. Um, but we rely heavily on the staff for interface. So m the, the, the interesting thing is my, my commissioner is actually the representative, and that's quite that's that hasn't always been the case. There's usually one, um, and it, it's one you know on the entire commission. Sometimes it's a chairman because the FSB is becoming more and more important as time goes on, and and there's arguably less emphasis on on, on IOSCO. 
And so what's interesting about my job is I do have some direct interface, but it's really through the staff and through my commissioner. I'm not calling um, you know, the Hong Kong uh, securities uh, regulators to discuss the finer points of uh, you know, kind of their version of the 40 Act. What we do is we do interface with them, but it's on a higher level. It's you know, how are we going to address this particular policy perspective. You know, this country is doing X on FSB. They're pushing here, or the FSB wants to do Y. Do we want to do Y and Y? Um, and then I try and, uh, you know, when she goes to these meetings and goes before them to, um, to help her to ha have something that, that she's gonna say that makes sense from, from, from a commission perspective, because she, she sits in a, um, in a commission, persp uh, you know, she's the representative for the entire agency at that point. So, you know, when we're counseling her as to what to say, we have to look beyond what her personal beliefs are. And there are times when commissioners who uh, in, you know, sit in, these, um, in, the, in the capacity of having to represent the agency it becomes difficult because you, uh, you're gonna have strongly held beliefs on a certain topic, um, but you set that aside in order to represent the agency. So I guess it's a, it's a long way of saying I don't usually deal directly with them. My my principal does, but it's you know with like the secretariat of the FSB, mm -hmm. and then our international affairs staff will deal directly mm -hmm. with their staff. And we actually have someone seconded at the FSB, um, and uh, with IOSCO we have um, a, a long-standing working relationship with them. So it's usually our staff mm -hmm. who's interfacing. And Lynn, would you like to respond to the question about what makes, or what international yep. aspect makes it so interesting for you? Yeah. And I, I think, well, being in the corporate realm, a little different from uh, Christians, I, I, what I really like about the international law aspect is the structuring that's involved. I like to analogize international law to playing a computer game at level 10. And there are a lot of obstacles, and you're really trying to work out different ways to get around it because there are so many different jurisdictions that have different new, unique obstacles. And that, that I find to be the fun part. You have to tie in tax. You have to tie in securities law sometimes. You have to tie in um, Article 9, various different areas. And you really think through how to weave them together to make your deal work. And when I think about the actual deal documentation, you're usually not, and in my world I'm dealing a lot with loan agreements, you're not dealing with a straight up loan agreement. You're dealing with an umbrella agreement that covers overall the relationships and then potential smaller ones in various different jurisdictions. So it's that, that structuring and that ability to try to weave through the different pieces that I find exciting and challenging. And, and that you get better over time and, and that, that keeps it fun. And the technology, as we call it, in doing deals increases and improves. And, and you kind of have different technology depending on the product, depending on the jurisdictions, and even depending on the regions. So I would say a product that I would use in Asia from a structuring perspective would be quite different from what I would do in Europe because of you know the, the, the types of jurisdictions there are there, the size of the economies, the cost it would be to have a local agreement versus a global one, et cetera. So that, that piece to me is, is very fun about doing international law. And in order to prepare yourself to do this kind of work, is there anything you have done in the past or that you continue to do now, <coughs> such as different courses or, I don't know, news sources or informational sources that you read? Um, or is it more just as you go, you learn from um, partners yeah. you've worked with and et cetera? Yeah. Well, I, I, with, with Professor Cox then in the background, I would say make sure you take his course. <laughs> Very critical course to take. Um, I, I would say that for, for me, what I find to be the single most important thing to help you succeed in international law, um, and I don't want to overly simplify it, is being savvy and comfortable with differences in different jurisdictions. And, and I say that because in many cases, you don't really need to know in definite detail what the particular laws are in each place to kind of work around that. But you need to be comfortable, as you would in your computer game, you may not know the next obstacle that comes, but you need to be comfortable so that when it comes, you know how to jump over it. And that's that, that savviness, that comfort when someone tells you, we don't do it this way, and your mindset is thinking, okay, why don't they do it the way we do it in the U.S.? That's not the question you should be asking. The question you should be asking is, they do it this way. Why, why can they be comfortable doing it that way in their jurisdiction? And really building in the cultural aspect of it, right? Um, and, and I think following on from that, that cultural sensitivity is a big part of international law. It's a big part of understanding the risks and why different jurisdictions have emerged the way they have. 
And that, that to me, that savviness and comfort is, is what I think to be the single most important thing for, for succeeding in international law. Christian, is there anything you'd like to add? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think it was really well said. I mean, I think the same principles really do apply into the, um, into the space I'm in. Are there any questions? I, yes, go ahead. Um, Ms. Chua, am I yes. pronouncing that right? Okay, I wasn't sure. Um, I just had a question, you kind of answered it already, but practicing international law at a law firm versus um, in-house, mm -hmm. kind of what different mm -hmm. takes, I mean, what are the differences and what similarities exist and which one kind of, I mean, you've been at GE for a while, so mm -hmm. you probably have gotten used to private, but like which one, what are the benefits of each? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think some of the differences are not unique to the international law space. They're just unique to being in-house versus being in a law firm. The, the biggest change for me, I think, in the international space and going from a law firm to in-house is really how you look at the transaction. I think in a law firm, you're focused on, you know, you, by the time you get a certain matter, in a corporate world, it's because there's a deal that has already come to the space where we're about, to, we're trying to get documentation ready. So both parties want to do the deal, it's just about getting the documents drafted in a way that works for all sides. So with that in mind, international space to me then means getting the document structured, drafted, and with the securities working in each of the jurisdictions, applying the conflict of laws worked out, so really executing on the deal, which the parties won. While going in-house, you kind of, in the time frame of a transaction, I think going in-house, you really start much earlier. You, you start at the point where people are just brainstorming. They're brainstorming about, should I start up a platform in China? And they're thinking, what, what do we have to do to do that? And they're thinking about rule of law in China. Are we comfortable with the rule of law in China or, or some may assert lack of? And how, how do we get comfortable with that? Um, so you're working through all of that before you get to the deal. And ironically, when you actually get to the deal frequently, that is then outsourced to the law firm. So I, I, I actually think being in-house gives you a more holistic perspective. And I think actually you need both, but being in-house gives you the experience of really seeing why they got to this point and the rationale behind it. And I think from an international law perspective, you really start thinking about the risks involved in not just closing that deal, but why we should even move further to get to the deal phase. Anyone else? Yes, go ahead. Um, as sort of trend, globalization trends um, mm -hmm. seem inexorable, um, is there, um, is there a, do you guys have a feeling that um, jobs, that more legal jobs in the future will require um, knowledge of international jurisdictions or at least some working knowledge of <coughs> systems that are not the same as those in America. And if that's the case, can you tell us sort of what we can do today mm -hmm. to either familiarize ourselves with those things or to be prepared to be valuable to people who need those skills in the future? Okay. Uh, it's interesting. I, um, let me have a uh, completely different view than I do on this one. And, and it's formed by part because of my experience on the securities area because the U.S. is, is a fairly well-developed securities law system. The people who look for securities lawyers want people who are really well-versed in U.S. law. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they, they I think it, as a general matter, understanding the way that the different systems work is going to be a benefit. But I think the, the specific skill set in the securities area that's going to be valuable to you is going to be, at least as an American lawyer, are going to be understanding U.S. law. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, I, I guess what I, I would add to that from that perspective, um, I, I think the understanding, I don't disagree with you, Christian, is a big part of it because that's where you're able to translate to your clients who see things from a U.S. perspective how this particular jurisdiction might be different or that particular transaction is otherwise. And, and I think to your point on your question on what we can do to kind of put yourself in that space, um, I, I know that when I look at lawyers and whether they're going to be suited for global international work, one thing that I do look at is whether they've actually spent time overseas. And, and I say that, I guess coming back to that savviness point, is because when you're actually sitting there 
hearing the language, being part of the culture, understanding why people think a certain way and the laws are set up a certain way. It gives you that element of savviness, that ability to flex and be comfortable to understand the different laws. And so that's something that I find valuable. So it doesn't, you know, it's not an opportunity that comes to everyone, but if you do get the opportunity to spend some time overseas in a professional manner, I encourage you to jump on it six months, a year, whatever it would be. I think that's always a big, you know, it's something that I view very positively when I look at someone's resume. As a lot of us are looking to, you know, do summer jobs or potentially take a semester abroad or going into our jobs, is there a suggestion about when one might go abroad, whether it's during a summer or how far once you start your career officially, um, would you recommend staying in the States first or going straight abroad, that kind of thing? That's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I personally have found it helpful that when you've developed your career to some degree and have an understanding, to Christian's point, of your own laws, Thereafter, when you then double in the international space, you're better able to appreciate and do the comparative analysis and really help your client when you get back home. Um, that being said, you know, I don't think everything falls so precisely in our careers with timing and choosing when you want to go. So I would say if the opportunity comes, even if you are younger in your career, you know, I, I still think that it will be viewed upon very positively. I think that's right. It's just as, as a practical matter, sometimes... Um Maybe hard to you know to see this now, but you know ten years into the future, it's going to be harder to you know sell that house and uh, you know uproot the kids out of you know elementary school, and you know it's you kind of snicker, but it's 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 true. Um, your your view of what's acceptable, uh, you know, uh, as a range of kind of different opportunities starts to narrow a little bit. For some people, not everyone. I mean, there's you know obviously you're you're much more valuable later on in your career, as as Lynn had said, um, but you know sometimes. You know, I see a lot of people who, um, some of the agency who spent time in like the London office of, you know, fill in the blank large law firm or the German, you know, wherever, lots of different overseas offices. And they're very glad they did that. And they always say, well, I, th I would be difficult to do that now. And it's only, it's only for practical reasons. You know, I have three kids. You know, how could we do, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, you know, again, if the opportunity comes later, it, you know, rent the house, you know, go abroad. Your kids would love it. I mean... You don't have to necessarily prescribe to that view. So, so each of you have made a number of transitions. Uh, with, even within the same firm, you've transitioned from one area to another and then out of the firm and to other, to other jobs. I wonder if you could speak specifically and comfortably about how you put yourself in a position to be able to make a transition, know about the opportunities, uh, or make others know uh, about your interesting opportunities, particularly, I think, given this audience of uh, transitioning to something that your practice has started out initially in, in a domestic area and then getting into a more international area. There you go. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, um, this is a really good question, and um, I have to say, it's probably it's such an art. Um, the idea of kind of being in the right place at the right time and it's a balance between you know dedicating yourself to being the best you can in what you're doing and also having an ear out for the next thing um, the especially at somewhere like um, you know the agency and the reason is because as you you know you'll reach a certain point in your career where you're going to want a little bit more stability and so, you know, there's, a, there's a, a choice you make at a certain point in your career, you know, do I need to leave the federal employee or do I need to, uh, you, know, what, you know, what do I want to do? And, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a more complex decision, but I think being able to be ready for the transition, I think is, is really taking advantage of the opportunity that's before you. So learn all you can in the short ter time period you have. There's, I've seen people who, who go in like two to three year increments, you know, to like the next thing. And th that seems to be more of, of, of kind of our generation, I guess, speaking only for me, maybe that started then, you know, where the old kind of 10 to 20 to 30 year blocks at the same place were more of the norm. That, you know, I, I rarely meet people my age and younger who've had that kind of experience. But, so I think it's, Taking advantage of the opportunities in your current position to learn all you can, being the best you can at what you're doing, but don't sacrifice going out to those events, keeping 
you know, in touch with your friends and your colleagues and everybody because the best opportunities come by word of mouth. They don't come through a headhunter. Um, they really come through people you know that you've impressed upon, that you've, that you've impressed, they've impressed you, that you just develop a, a friendship or a relationship with. And, and really that's, um, in, in my experience, has been how lots of opportunities come. But, but I do think there are some people who have like these guidelines, you know, spend 70% on your, you know, your current job and, you know, 30% finding the next job. Or there are all sorts of guidelines like this. And, and, and even more direct, some people say the first thing you do at your new job is look for your next job. So you're, it's, it's constantly keeping this in your mind and doing something about it. You must act. You can't assume that it will always come to you. So you need to, you need to be out there. You need to be talking to people. It's not things like, you know, hey, in two years, I'm going to be out, you know, I want to, you know, go to your law firm. Do you think you can make a spot for me? It's stuff like, tell me what you do at the law firm. Tell me about your practice. I'm interested in you know, finding out a little bit more. It's those types of things that lead to the next, well, when you're ready, why don't you give me a call? You know, it's that kind of, you don't have to be necessarily so direct. And you probably don't and always want to be. Um, but there's a certain uh, interplay that you'll develop, I think, with others and throughout your career as an ability to keep your ears open. And, and you, know, you want to, to show your current employer that you're completely dedicated to them. But I have to say, the best employers are those that understand you're there and they want you to develop. They want you to do better, okay? So they're gonna encourage that. I'm talking about like a month later, if you leave, they're gonna be awfully unhappy with you, <laughs> all right? Um, but but they're, they understand that you're an investment, especially if you stay within the same organization. They want you to develop and move on. Um, not all employers are, are necessarily of that view and you have to work at it. Seek out the mentors, seek out the, the, the peers who can help you advance. And Lynn probably could do a better job with the domestic to international transition, I think, than I could. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I think, Christian, you've hit, you've hit a lot of the items, you know, that I would like to reiterate. Um, just building those relationships. Uh, I guess my, I try to believe that you really need to build relationships before you need them. We've all heard that before. But I do think that's really correct in terms of building your career. So, it, it, especially in the international space, and maybe back to that point of savviness, um, your relationships um, in the international space really do come back to help you as your career develops. So, I, I think a very concrete example, I went through the LM class, and some of you are in the program or, are, or, or have friends who are in that program. That person that's sitting next to you in that program is going to be a very useful resource in about 10 years' time. And you're not thinking about it now and wouldn't seem so because he or she's such a clown. How could they possibly be useful to me? <laughs> but they will be. They will be as you all mature and develop. And it, it is, it's amazing when I, when I think of a lot of the lawyers that we look to use um, for, as external counsel, I would very quickly go to someone I know who has gone to Duke and has a good... Um, and I know what, what they would provide and deliver to me versus someone I completely haven't tested at all. So, you know, work on those relationships. And, and also emphasizing your other point on just not your peers, but also the relationships in terms of mentors and sponsors. I, I agree that is incredibly important and, and something that we can all do much more of. Um, and, and likewise, again, at where you are at the law school, um, Cox is, is a wonderful um, resource, even so today I'm still trying to get time in his very busy agenda, always to try to find time. And um, so use those resources and build those relationships. Um, and now's the best time when you don't actually need them so that over time, um, and you've developed it, it's, it's much easier than to place that call, send that email and say, I'd love to get your advice and have that chat. Are there any other questions? Go ahead. Have the events of 2008 and the European debt crisis changed the way you practice law? And if so, like, what do you do differently now than you may have done in the past? That's a, I mean, it's a great question. It's a really a watershed. And as far as from my perspective, um, I mean, since I've been at the agency, and this will show to some extent my tenure there, I started just after Sarbanes-Oxley, right? And everybody was like, this is the biggest thing since 1934, <laughs> you know, you know. Well, yeah, you know, Dodd-Frank, you know, came along 2010, and the same things are being said. 
uh, the agency has just hundreds of, of rulemakings. And uh, in, in the 40 Act space, you know, entire, my entire practice probably from 2010 to 2011 was spent implementing and working uh, on, on those things. You know, with, you know, the hedge fund registration is probably the most well-known, most well-known one. Is that me? Um, but, but I think, you know, so the substance has, it's been a focus for, for me, for sure. Um, in the sense, I don't think it's necessarily changed the way I do it. It's changed more of the substance. I mean, I've been working very, very hard on it, but that's 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 certainly you know what I always do. It hasn't necessarily changed you know the process. I would say, other than just the weird and wonderful way that the legislative process works. Um, but certainly, the the substance of Dodd Frank has been a really a, quite a significant part of what I do. Lynn, has it made an impact at all in your career since you've been a GE? Um, tremendously, tremendously. I think since 2008, I mean, the, in, in the corporate international space, I would say that the, the focus before that was very much on domestic deals that might have an international flavor. And I'm, I'm probably saying this quite high level. But since the crisis and liquidity has been drying up and, those, and, and thereafter looking at the global markets that were booming at a different pace, that definitely has been much more of a focus in looking at whether we can generate our revenues overseas. I don't think that in itself is new. I think it's a matter of the degree and your emphasis. Well, before it was, let's focus on where it's easier, I would say, to make money, and we'll just do the international ones if it's big enough. Now there's a genuine desire to say, how can we develop a platform or a real presence in those global space? Are there any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. That's right. So you said you worked at a law firm in the Netherlands. What mm -hmm. differences? Then were you providing different perspectives? Were you more working as like helping American law firms in New York understand the perspective of international law firm of inter different um, mm -hmm. jurisdictions? And then in the Netherlands, were you providing more of like an American perspective to a more European right focus? Um, I, I think a little bit of both. Um, the firm that I practiced in and the transactions that I did really focused on pan-European and international banking transactions. And so for that reason, um, it, it wasn't really specific to one jurisdiction. And as it comes to European banking laws, a lot of them tend to be UK-based um, with a specific local element when it deals with securities, as an example. So a lot of my focus was doing the UK piece of it. Um, that being said, Holland, which is where I practice, is a civil law jurisdiction. So um, you can't really sit there and practice in a law firm really without getting a sense of what the local laws are. So I did do some courses on local civil codes and understanding how they operate differently there. And in some of the work that I was dealing, I'll work closely with the local lawyers in putting together the transactions, both the U.S. piece, the U.K. piece, and, and, and the Dutch piece. Uh, what about use of foreign languages? How has that made an impact on your practice? Or has it, have you been able to find things mainly in English, or do you find it's a benefit to have another language? I, I am, you know, big on languages. So I would say it's been absolutely beneficial to me. Um, I personally speak Mandarin, Dutch, and French. And I utilize them really quite frequently in, in my career to the extent I can. And I, I'm not sure, I don't think I necessarily use it to negotiate a high-level transaction. I actually use it in terms of how I connect with the other parties on, on certain matters. So for instance, if I'm working with someone out of China, um, it, it allows me to, if, if a particular lawyer there is explaining to me how a particular local code works and why it operates that way, I frequently would ask to see that legislation and have a read of it myself because it helps me understand better what they're trying to express. So I, I find that very helpful. I find it very helpful in be, being able to connect with them on that level. And, and to me, language, is, language opens doors. It, it automatically gives people a sense that you are, you are willing to take their perspective and understand why they do things a certain way. So I, I find languages to be phenomenal. And, and we, we are ensuring that our kids are trying to speak as many languages as possible. <laughs> I could not agree more. Um, you know, I see in the workplace every day 
um, at the agency. For example, in our international affairs office, there are a couple of people who speak Mandarin. You know, that's highly sought after because you know, we have a lot of negotiations with um, with Mandarin speakers. I speak Mandarin. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk after. Um, uh, uh, a lot of negotiations with Mandarin speakers, and it's just very helpful. You know, you don't lose anything in translation uh, mm -hmm. for one thing because you go to these negotiations and it's you and like four people, and then there are fifty. Mm -hmm. You know, and people in multiple rows and people are wearing headsets. You know, it's. You, to be able to understand the nuances is, is, is very important. And, you know, I mean, as a more general matter, I mean, if it's anything, you know, of course, Spanish in, in our country is incredibly important. And in the securities law realm, we, we use it a lot. I don't utilize it. I speak Portuguese. I lived in Brazil. I don't have as much opportunity to utilize that language. I wish I did. But, um, but my children are learning Mandarin and Spanish. So if that's any indication as to how important I think, fact, Lynn and I talk all the time about uh, the importance of doing that. So I think it's, it's extremely valuable. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Apart from getting you know, six months or like an extended period of time in a foreign country via a firm or something else, uh, how often, or is there other specific sectors of international law where you'd be traveling more often? Um, does it depend, depend if you're going private or public? I mean, what do you? What kind of role does travel have in your legal profession? Um, I'm happy to take that. In, in that, in in my space, I would say travel has become less important than before. Um, I think in part to do with the crisis, the fact that people are a lot more conscious of costs. Um, that being said, I think there's a genuine awareness and recognition everywhere that if you're going to be doing some of these international matters, you really do need to see people face to face. So I'd say it's, it's probably now a healthy balance of traveling when you can um, and using what technology has now provided to us, whether it's you know, through video conferencing um, or the likes of that, using that to the fullest. And, and you, you see that. I think, I think a lot of organizations are getting much better at, at recognizing the cost savings, at recognizing the benefits of being able to see people. And um, so in that sense, travel... To, uh, to, to Christian's point earlier about how it gets harder the, the more uh, further on you are in your career path in your own personal life, I think that, that the advent of, of technology has helped us tremendously in being able to still be there but not have to travel to be there. You know, I, I, just from my perspective, the people I see traveling, I mean, she, my boss travels quite a bit. Um, but, you know, in, as a commissioner for the SEC, it's going to not be a representative uh, type of career. But the folks in our international affairs office do travel quite a bit. Our, mm. our director is, is on the road all the time. But you raise an interesting point, which, you know, there are these um, technology centers where we can go within Washington to interface. You know, it's, right. you know, multiple screens, you know, face to face, right. but, you know, miles away. Right. And that's been quite helpful. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I'm a Chinese student, I'm an international analyst student. Mm -hmm. uh, just now you talk about uh, the, the week about the rule of law in China and how it influenced the uh, business strategy decision whether to invest in China or not. And I, like, um, when I was in the law school in China, we recognized this kind of issue, like there is some serious problem in our legal system. And we learned, I talk, we talked about how to resolve this issue, and but it's only in theoretical level. And then, like we many students, like many people want to get the answer, so they go out, go abroad, like me, to come to the U.S. to learn the system, like here. But like when I come here to study, and I feel like even more confused because, for example, like I, I was learning the business association class, I found there are so many similar in the business system in China and the U.S., but why it works here and doesn't work in China. Mm -hmm. so, um, I, so, well, maybe like my personal question is, um, do you have any suggestion that we can learn here, like the knowledge or skill so that we can bring back to China as a lawyer to improve the situation there and to like to make my me personal to be a good lawyer in China to practice law. Um, I think I think what big, the big benefit that you get out of being here is being able to understand really the quite the opposite for what we're saying before the U.S. perspectives and why um, in the U.S. they're focused on certain items whether it's regulatory or otherwise. And I think use that opportunity while you're here to understand those perspectives so that when you go back. And assuming you are then at that point in time advising international companies, um, including U.S. companies, you are able to help translate to them 
and connect the bridge between China that does it this way. I know it sounds weird from the U.S. perspective, which you understand. How do we bridge the gap, and, and why is it that you should get comfortable looking at it through Chinese lens? So I think the big benefit is being able to see both sides and connect that. And that, that I think that's, I know it's a little, it's a little um, high level to say it that way, but I think just being here and, and reading through and understanding through a lot of those classes, the, the thinking behind the codes here, the legislation here, is going to help you tremendously back home. Any further questions? No. Well, thank you so, so much for coming to join us. I'm sure we all really, really enjoyed your talk and all your advice. So why don't we give a hand to our speakers? Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.